Welcome to The Last Ottoman, a podcast series in which we discuss the Ottoman Empire and its legacy today. We are at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. My name is David Selim Sayers. And today, for this very first episode of The Last Ottoman, it is my honor to welcome filmmaker Adam Egoyan on the 20th anniversary of Ararat, his groundbreaking film about the Armenian genocide, which, if you haven't watched it yet, you should immediately turn off this podcast, find it and watch it, and then watch it again and again and again. Adam, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Adam, as I, 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 like, to, I like the plug to watch it again and again and again. I think that's... Uh... <laughs> well, you know, I, I, because that's what I had to do before I felt that I had any kind of meaningful grip on the film, to be honest. You know, uh, I had to watch it yeah. again and again and again before I felt that, okay, and... To be honest with you, I mean, this, you know, I'm just going to go into this right now because I'm, I'm, so, I'm also fascinated by the process with which viewing the film uh, enables you to get to know this particular film. I've always thought of this. I mean, it's, it's one of my, fa it's, it's my favorite kind of film, I have to say, because it's, it's a film where I feel it has either, it's like a puzzle with either too many pieces or not enough pieces. And every time you put it together, you get a different picture, but it's never quite complete or there's always something extra left over. So you have to watch it again and then you form another uh, impression of it. And then you watch it again and you form another impression of it. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. So in that sense, I do really encourage people to watch it again and again and again. Well, it, it, it's it's designed as a, as a as a refracting machine in a way you know it it refracts uh a number of points of views and it uh is quite challenging that way and certainly i think that uh, you know there's there's the spine of the film which is this moment where uh a, a young man is being held by a customs officer And, uh, you know, his retelling of his story really forms the, the, the spine of the film. But we, it takes a while to get there and to understand that that is the, the support structure. Right, right. Yeah. And there's so much going on around it. And, and we're yeah. going gonna, gonna to dwell into that. But before we go into any sort of details of the plot or of the character interactions in the film, I want to ask you a question of a more general nature. Because as I said earlier, this year, 2022, marks the 20th anniversary of Ararat. Now, I personally am a fir firm believer that as soon as a work leaves the hands of its makers, it takes on a life of its own and starts revealing sides of itself and of the world around it that no one even thought of while making it. So my question for you is, what has Ararat revealed to you in its first two decades of life? Well, it, it has revealed that it's, that it's open. There's an openness to the film uh, that invites all sorts of responses. And I've had to distance myself from the immediate response. I think there was a film that a lot of people were expecting to see, Uh, and there was a reaction to what the film was. Uh, you have to remember that 20 years ago, there had been no widely distributed film about the Armenian genocide. And it's fascinating to me that in the 20 years since its premiere, we've had three films. We've had uh, Fatih Akin's The Cut. We've had the Taviani brothers' uh, Lark Farm. And of course, we've had The Promise, Uh, a, a kind of a Hollywood version starring Christian Bale and Oscar Isaacs. And what's interesting, I have to say, is that the film within the film that you find in Ararat actually anticipates some of the issues that these three films have raised. But you have to remember that those three films didn't exist when Ararat was released. So... Uh, it was having a conversation with a type of film that was to come. Actually, that was to come three times. So that's been fascinating. Right, I so, think that, yeah. No, I, I was just curious whether there was something that you would pinpoint as specifically the film within your film uh, pointing out that these three subsequent films ended up actually doing. Well, it, it's, there, there's something problematic to me about uh, the cinematic representation of an event which has as 
its most defining feature, the notion of denial. That, that when I was making Ararat, I felt that I had to somehow find a way of speaking of the denial of this event. Uh, and that's, I think, what is most challenging about the film, because it's, it's, it's not told in a straightforward way. I was mortified of the idea of it being a propaganda piece. So propaganda by its nature has to be very simple, has to be almost didactic. And there are certainly moments when Rafi is talking about the film, which come off that way, but it's held within this nest of um, images and scenes and points of view, which, as I said before, are ref refracted, you know, through many different perceptions. Now, when you look at these three films, um, they're pretty straightforward. And, you know, they're really dealing with, with uh, almost a classic narrative structure. And I'm not sure if any three of them are completely successful in, in refuting the denial of the history. But then again, that's a pretty tall order to expect that any single film is going to uh, reconfigure an event that's been denied by its perpetrators and continues to be denied to this day. So it's it's almost questioning what, what is it that we expect a film to do? And, and certainly Ararat presents that. Right, it does. Because from the images we get to see of uh, uh, Edward Saroyan's film, played by uh, the character played by Charles Aznavour, we probably can suspect that this is a film that's not going to really land in our current culture, that it feels quite kitschy and overblown, and it feels like a film from a different time. But, and I think, interestingly, there are images that don't feel that different from what you see in the Lark Farm or the Cut or the uh, or, or the Promise. You know, I think, and I'm I, I'm not an expert on this, but there is, you know, and you're a specialist, I suppose. You know, the Ottoman uh, period uh, has certain visual elements which are very difficult to portray because they seem somehow uh, well, exotified, and they seem uh, that there's something, uh, it's just challenging. It was challenging for us to actually, for instance, in designing the sets and designing the, you know, because it, this particular period, late Ottoman period, because it was transitional, and of course, what was to happen in Turkey uh, under Ataturk and this whole modernization of this period, it's difficult to refer to the late Ottoman period without it seeming like a cliche. And, and especially, cool. especially, I think it becomes difficult once, as you do, you move outside of the capital and you move into a sort of into the province about which there is much less recorded, of course, because everything is, it tends to be about, tends to be about the imperial capital and what was going on there. Absolutely. And so actually we had to reconstruct a whole village and we had to kind of do the research we could. But, you know, we, you know, the, the extraordinary thing because of the Vilayet system, you know, is that these these uh, communities were um, uh, difficult to imagine because they were preserving, you know, cultural traditions. Uh, and yet within this context of a system that uh, actually up to a certain point was working very well as a multicultural system. Yes, yes. Until it didn't, until it began to fall apart. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that that is, uh, I mean, the, the sort of decentralization aspect of the Ottoman Empire, or not even decentralization, because there was no centralization. This is what, one of the most interesting aspects that mm. sort of draw me uh, to the topic in general of the Ottoman Empire, this fact that, you know, uh, the, the, the certain extent of autonomy uh, that was granted, legal autonomy, religious autonomy, to a certain extent that was granted, regional autonomy, 
just simply because of the the impossibility, the, the the sort of infrastructural and physical impossibility to 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 control all of that stuff uh, in a uh, that that massive amount of land in a in a meaningful way from a from a from a central uh, point, right? I mean, the the interesting thing that you bring up, okay, until it didn't work, uh, the question of nationalism and w when does nationalism become a sort of um, a feasible enterprise? Well, it becomes a feasible enterprise with certain technologies in place, with a certain industrialization with certain infrastructure in place that that allows for this kind of centralization centralization of an education system centralization of a legal system etc but i don't want to go into a lecture about the, the this uh, the decentral or the centralization of the ottoman empire i mean i think what you said about the subject was already very succinct uh, i would like you i would like to draw you back a little bit to what you were saying about the comparison between sort of your film and the other films that sort of followed in its wake because when i teach Ararat. I mean, I've been teaching Ararat for many years now. It's been an indispensable part of, uh, of my teaching on politics and cinema. Uh, and whenever I teach it, I'm always struck by the way how it enables students to approach certain subjects that they might have otherwise considered taboo. And that is not just the Armenian genocide in particular, but topics that can be challenging for anyone regardless of background, uh, such as identity or trauma. And I feel that I don't believe, I mean, I haven't tr attempted to teach these other films that you re uh, refer to. I haven't attempted to teach The Cut or the other films in class. But I do not think that they would produce the same effect of openness, opening uh, the, the, the students up to, uh, to this kind of debate, or instead of polarizing them, uh, kind of giving them the space to breathe and giving them the space to sort of experiment with different ideas and with different perspectives on, 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 the, on the subject matter. And I, I find that to be sort of, this is something that I feel art does. Uh, art enables you Art gives you that opening. So uh, since you are somebody who has created an opening like this, and I've, I'm, my courses bear witness to that, I wanted to ask you how you feel that it is that art can manage to open the space for sharing and discussion when in other realms, such as politics or even scholarship, uh, often the end result is simply polarization. I think it could be reduced to maybe one word. Uh, which is ambiguity. Uh, scholarship and, and, and politics don't have a lot of space for ambiguity, uh, which are uh, you know, multiple ways of interpreting something. Uh, again, uh, we try in our, in our academic wor work and, and certainly in, in, in politics to be as, as clear as possible. People demand that. But I think uh, in the realm of art, you know, we, we welcome this idea of a multiplicity of interpretations. So in thinking of Ararat, there, is, there are scenes, the scenes that I'm closest to are the scenes that I understand are um, trying to find a way of incorporating different points of view and responses. Like I think of the scene in the hallway between Ali and uh, Rafi, when he gives the, uh, the bottle of champagne. And when he says like, you know, like this is a new space, this is a new country. So let's just, you know, fuck the history and, and, and just have a drink. And it's so inviting to Rafi. And I've been in those situations, but then you, there's a suspicion or there's this fear that comes up. And what, what, what Rafi responds to by, by, by bringing up the Hitler quote, about who remembers the uh, extermination of Armenians. What he doesn't realize is that that quote out of context would be interpreted by Ali as an accusation that, that he's a Nazi or that, you know, that he, you know, and, and, and then you can see on Ali's, an extraordinary performance by Ali's Koteas, but you can see that this very open character suddenly darkens and actually becomes quite malevolent but he's been triggered to do that by this response that Rafi gives out of a, a knee-jerk reaction. And that actually, more than anything, shows what the nature of this dynamic has been. And I'm very proud of that scene because I, I think you can analyze what goes on there, but it, it, it's very complex. And I'm very proud that the camera was on these two actors and you can see the whole thing. 
But I, 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 I do think that, uh, you know, I, I don't expect a viewer to understand exactly what the energy is that's flowing between the two of them, but only to see that there's a blockage. And that blockage is uh, really at the core of what the, the issue that the film tries to raise, which is that, that the experience of denial is something that is transmitted. That many of these feelings uh, of, of, of uh, unresolved uh, status uh, actually reverberate through individuals and through families and through the relationship between parents and children, and even relationship between strangers. And, and actually the most, the most positive force in the film is that you have a young man, Rafi, who has experienced a retelling of his history through this historic epic that he's been an observer to as a production assistant, as a driver, uh, a, a, as the person who's actually driving the, the, the character who's playing Jeb de Bay, the, the monster of the province of Van. Uh, a, a kind of a demon uh, in terms of the Armenian experience, I suppose. Um, so he's driving this character home and, and he's actually projected something into him, which the actor is really uh, <laughs> trying to struggle with in a very genuine way. As I think, you know, you have to, this is important to say, 20 years ago, the recognition of this event was not at the level it is now. So I think it was quite possible for you know, a half Turkish actor to assume this role and to actually not understand exactly what the history was, but to actually just want to play the role as he does. Right. In that, in that wonderful scene where he's approaching, uh, uh, and I say wonderful just because the acting is so wonderful, not, not, not that my work is so wonderful, but when he approaches Charles Aznavour and he tries to clarify what happened after he's played the role. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so all of these scenes are, you know, like they're they're challenging because they reconfigure uh, cliches, not cliches, but they re reconfigure uh, monolithic ways of thinking that exist between within the Armenian community at that time, 20 years ago when I made the film and within the Turkish uh, community as well. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the, uh, what you said about ambiguity that sort of really uh, struck me as, uh, as, as, as what enables, what it, sort of the multiple perspectives, the, the multiple ways of approaching the work of art, enabling, uh, enabling this kind of discussion, enabling this kind of open space. So I want to keep on the topic of ambiguity and ask you another question about that, because one sense, I mean, uh, Ararat is a film that sort of plays with ambiguity on a, on, a, on a variety of different levels. It doesn't just play with ambiguity on the level that you just described of this uh, uh, sort of what, what are the sort of positioning, where does the positioning of the characters come from, but also uh, it is a very, very ambiguous when it comes to its portrayal or, or its uh, sort of um, its engagement of history, of memory and of fiction, because the film does intertwine various temporal layers and often leaves us uncertain whether particular scenes actually belong to history yeah. or memory yeah. or fiction, yeah. or even yeah. whether there is a clear line to be drawn between these three. So there is like a, a prime example of the ambiguity that the film throws at us. So why did you find it important to provoke this uncertainty, especially when it comes to this matter of history and memory and fiction? And I imagine that that must have been particularly challenging to sort of express in a film that is about a topic that is as charged and as polarizing as the Armenian genocide. Yes. And I think that going back to what we said at the beginning, this is what led to, there was, there was a, 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 I would say quite a hostile reaction against the film from Armenians themselves. Uh, and certainly from, from, from certain critics as well, uh, who were branding it as being propaganda often without having really, you know, understood or seen the film that I had made. Um, but I think Armenians wanted something clearer and, 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 and more straightforward. And, and, and they deserve that, certainly. And as I said, in the 20 years since, they, they, they've, they've gotten those films. But as this, you know, being the first film out of the gate. Now, in fact, there, there had been other films. There was a film called Ravished Armenia, a silent film that was made uh, in 1919, no, 1921, I think, which is lost. We only have a, a fragments of it. And there was a film by Henri Vernoy called Myrig, 
uh, which in fact, in some ways, is what the Edward Sroin's film is referring to. Uh, this was a film with Claudio Cardinal and Omar Sharif that had limited distribution, I would say, uh, in, in the English speaking world. But um, I, I'm thinking that, that, that really, I needed to tell a film that was about four generations, the generation of a, of a survivor, played in this case by Charles Aznavour, the generation of, uh, sorry, let me correct that. The, the survivor is played by Arshil Gorky. Well, he's, so, he plays uh, Arshil Gorky. Yes. Uh, no, no. Charles uh, uh, Aznavour is playing the child of a survivor. Right, right. So that's the other generation. So the first generation is the survivor, played by, uh, portrayed by Arshil Gorky, the abstract expressionist genius, played here by Simon Abkarian, French actor. The child of the survivor is Charles Aznavour, playing Edward Soroyan, the director of the historic film, wanting to tell his mother's story. There's the grandchild of the survivor, played by Arsene Hanjian, who's the academic. And there's the great-grandchild, Rafi. So four generations are floating through this film. Now, the one of the questions you need to ask as you're watching it is, how much of a role does Arshil Gorky play? Because he's shoehorned into this when, I don't want to make this too complicated, uh, but he's shoehorned into the historic film halfway through the shoot because of this lecture that the screenwriter and the director attend given by Ani. Right, right. So, so like realistically, as we're watching these historic scenes, we have to wonder how much of, of Arshil Gorky is actually in that historic film, or are these scenes floating somewhere within the nest of images that my film is presenting? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 Gorky, the Gorky scenes, I think, are the most ambiguous ones, where you, yeah. where you really have to ask yourself, okay, is this now the film showing us how it imagines really Arshil Gorky being at that point in the 1930s in New York City, or is this part of Saroyan's film? So, so the Gorky... And, and the child that he was in Vaughan, which we now understand he was a, a, a child, we don't know if he was a child soldier, but he was in living in Vaughan during the... Uh, events that the film depicts. So when we're seeing images of young Gorky, um, and maybe that figure is in the film, the relationship and, you know, it, it, it's very ambiguous because the film ends with a scene where he's seeing his mother sewing a button. And that doesn't feel like that would have any place in Edward Soroyan's film. Yes, yes. It, 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 and, and yet it, it's, it's, it's the crucial scene where we're seeing the button and and the whole construction. I mean, this is a very this is one of the masterpieces of of, of, of the 20th century. Is, is this painting, a portrait of the artist and his mother? Which there are two versions of it. One that hangs at the National Gallery in Washington, and the other is at the Whitney in New York. So Gorky was obsessed with this painting, and the position in it is very deliberate. But this moment that I've created, a dialogue with the mother, where she notices that a button is missing. And, you know, to place the hand there, to compose that very famous uh, uh, portrait, uh, which is taken from a photograph. I mean, this is all imagination. It's conjecture. Like there's no, so, so the role of conjecture in, in, a, in a historic piece, which has a responsibility to tell the truth. You know, it's, it's, these are complex ideas. Uh, but I wanted the film to open up this dialogue. You know, and, and, and so it's a tall order. It's, right. Because, uh, I mean, as you were saying earlier, you're not going to make anyone happy with it, right? I, and I didn't really, you know, that wasn't the intention of this film. It was a unique opportunity I was presented with. I won't go into the details of how it happened, but I was given this opportunity. And uh, I had in my early 20s written uh, when I just became inflamed with all of this issue of Armenian politics. And I was I was coming from the... You know, a, 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 I was raised in a city in, in Canada where there wasn't an Ar Armenian community to speak of. So when I came to Toronto to study, suddenly there was an Armenian Student Association. I, I became aware of this. It was a time of a lot of political activity. 
the, the, the Armenian terrorist attacks that are referred to in the film were happening around me, like during that period. So I was really engaged with this. And I, I, wrote a I just script. sorry. I just wanted to point out your air quotes because our because our uh, uh, our podcast listeners are not going to be able to see the air quotes that you put around the terrorists. So I just wanted. Oh, yeah, to, I mean because because yeah. they're they're terrorists, but or they're or are they freedom fighters? And that's raised in the in the film as well. And 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 uh, anyway, uh, I think that I as a result of a lot of things that were going in my mind, I written a, a script in my early twenties, which was based on Clarence Usher's account of what happened in Van. So when uh, a producer, Robert Lantosh, you know, approached me and said that he was prepared to, to finance this film quite, quite unexpectedly. Um, and, but we had to do it very quickly because, you know, there, were, there, were, there was a, a fund that he had access to and it had to be done quite quickly, <laughs> which is ridiculous because uh, I, 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 I found this old script that I'd written many years before. And um, what but, and then I realized it didn't reflect what I was feeling. It didn't reflect, you know, the, the emotions I now had. And so this is how that script became the film within the film. Oh, and okay. So that's what happened. All right. All right. No. So um, actually uh, talking about uh, the feelings that you had about the, about the whole issue as a young man. And uh, uh, you, you, you've already made reference to the character Rafi, who, who goes into this whole thing as a young man and comes out of it as a slightly more wise man, one would imagine. It uh, brings me uh, to Rafi. And uh, uh, because one of my most indelible memories from Ararat is when Rafi tells David, uh, the, 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 the customs officer, the Canadian customs officer, about the 1915 defense of Van by Armenian resistance fighters against the Ottoman army. And here I'm going to quote, uh, we hadn't done anything like that since we held back the Persians, Rafi says. And when did you hold back the Persians, David asks, uh, to which Rafi replies, 415. Now, <laughs> whenever I hear someone use the first person plural in this way, ever since watching that film for the first time, I've had to think of Rafi. And while part of me feels jealous of the natural ease with which he claims his trans-historical identity, <laughs> another part feels quite uneasy with the way that he takes pride in and personal ownership of things that happen to other people in a different time and place. So now, as someone who probably went through uh, a couple of different stages in your your uh, sort of um, in your um, wrestling with your identity that are similar to those of Rafi. How do you feel about Rafi's we in this scene? That's a great question. Well, first of all, I have to correct the date. It, it, it's four, five, four, five, one, not four, one, five. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, correction. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a mythological battle. Every Armenian uh, knows about this. It, it was... Uh, it's, it, it was basically uh, Bardan um, um, Mamakonian. It was the, uh, you know, and, and he's this, uh, you know, legendary figure. And it was it, uh, the Battle of Vas in Vasburikan. And it, 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 it now, it, it didn't actually defeat the Persians, as it turns out. I mean, it, it, it was a big battle, but the Persians ultimately won. Uh, but it certainly paved the way for what was, uh, uh, what was it called? The the Navarsak Treaty, I think, which was uh, later, like about 50 years later, which gave the Armenians the right to practice Christianity. So, you know, it was a, but, but, but the battle is, is the stuff of mythology, certainly. Um, now, you ask a really interesting question. Why is he saying we? How is he? And I think what is happening to Rafi is that he had had the experience of watching this film being made uh, as a driver, as, 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 uh, as really just some, an observer. He felt it wasn't telling the story that he felt. And he made this crazy journey to Turkey to kind of uh, discover it for himself. And he's now coming back with these cans of film and he's concocted some story to, that he gives to the customs officer about what's in the cans. Um, and a curious thing happens. For something that he will never understand, which is Christopher Plummer, the custom officer's own relationship to his family, and also the fact that this is his last inspection before he retires, for reasons that Rafi doesn't understand, this customs officer, this stranger, gives him a lot of time and allows him to tell his version 
of his own history. And this empowers Rafi beyond any way that might have been anticipated. This actually inflames him. And for all the confusion he's felt in, you know, around his father, what the father's action was, what it was to watch this historic drama being made, the breakup with his stepsister, the, you know, the, the, all this terrible history that he's experienced, the ability to retell his version of it to this stranger in a position of authority, a person who can determine his life, actually it becomes a crucible and it transforms him. And he owns that history for the first time. So I don't think he would have said the we before the meeting with the customs officer. Right. I, I don't think he would have claimed that history as his in the, with the same fervor that he does at that moment. No, I, 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 I tend to agree with you because the way that I read sort of Rafi's development uh, in the film, and please feel, feel free to comment on that, is that there is at, at first this sort of understanding of his identity intellectually, let's say cerebrally somewhat, and through, through his knowledge of Armenian history. And then, uh, and then it's, he enters into this sort of vicarious realm where he tries to sort of, uh, um, pro sort of project his outrage uh, uh, onto, onto the actor Ali as you, or onto Jeff Detbay via the performance of, uh, of Ali, as you were saying earlier. But neither sort of the intellectual understanding nor the sort of vicarious sort of re sort of sort of cathartic somewhat uh, reliving of these emotions helps to bring this uh, to bring this identity home what really helps i feel is that this sort of he takes this affirmative gesture of his research trip to turkey and risks i mean when he comes back and he has this interrogation with david he has this, he takes on this these enormous personal risks personal sacrifice the possibility of losing sort of uh, having something on his on his criminal record etc cetera, etc cetera. and and that sort of having done something affirmative in his own life, not connected to history, not something vicarious, but having brought something about that identity to life for himself is what makes the identity so salient for him. Yeah, and I would say that the, uh, now that we're talking about this, and it never occurred to me, but it's an interesting point that what he's also done is he's actually played out an episode of his own past, a uh, um, deep past, which is that you know, the Armenians who trusted the young Turks uh, actually were betrayed, you know, who, who gave uh, 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 their support to the Itais movement. Um, uh, because, you know, the Armenians' uh, support of that was very important and crucial. But there was this other, uh, there was a betrayal. So what happened with Rafi in, in Turkey, where he meets this, uh, this, this Turk who, who gives him these cans, and basically asks him to develop this film. Um, you know, he's he's been effectively, as we find out in the film, betrayed because he's being used as a drug mule. I'm, I'm I won't uh, I'm giving it away, I suppose. But whatever is in those cans has a almost a, a, a mystical kind of ability. It's like a potion because it's it's able to uh, create this other reality for the customs officer. And that whole idea, that space where it goes black, where the room goes black, right. you know, it's, it's actually referring to a, a moment in the Armenian church service where the, where, you know, a moment of transformation where, where the, where the lights are, are, are taken down and candles are lit. But so in darkness, there's this transubstantiation in a way. Right. Right. And so when 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 uh, the customs officer is trying to explain it to his son, uh, you know, the next day, what happened that that mo that that night before, he's he says that you know I you know, the question of belief <laughs> is put in a very unusual way. Right. It, 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 it's it, it's listen, even discussing it now, it, it's it's very loaded. It is, uh, and I'm I'm very proud of the film in as much as it's able to invite these questions. But I also think it's it's a tall order to expect that anyone's going to absorb this all the first time through. Absolutely, so I, I packed a lot into this film. Yeah, because I realized it was a, an opportunity, and there was a lot that I needed to uh, express. And 
one could well argue that it should have been a, a, a longer work or it should have been uh, more carefully edited, but, you know, we didn't have the time, you know, like, it, 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 and, and in a way, I, I feel that the, maybe it's messiness is part of what makes it so alluring. In oh, a way, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what I was trying to say at the beginning when I said that you should watch it again and again. And the fact that it's sort of like a puzzle with too many pieces or not enough pieces. And now that you said that you didn't have enough time to finish it, that makes me think of uh, one of my sort of um, standard references from a completely different audiovisual medium, Japanese anime, where we know that the last two episodes of the sort of legendary anime series, Neon Genesis Evangelion, were filmed the way they were filmed because there was not enough money, there was not enough time, they couldn't do what they originally planned to do with that series, so they concocted this bizarre ending to the they 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 put so much i mean they, they they did so much with so little and it came out of the improvisation of not having enough time not having enough money to be able to uh to to, to be able to uh, um bring their original vision to fruition and that's in a way that's, that's what made the, the, yeah that's what made the whole thing so legendary so sometimes this is this kind of thing is fortuitous yeah. but, and, and of course it's also absurd to think that rafi uh you know like would have gone to turkey to make you know like get plates for for digital um, like like reconfiguring of a film that's already finished you know like I mean the, the you know we understand that he actually by coincidence is arriving back to Canada the night of the premiere so so you know it, it, it's it's it, this idea of uh, schedule the 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 the, the demands of time and, and, and when things need to be finished by and, and, and how uh, you can work on something forever or you can work on something where you, where that, the, where the closure of it is, is forced on you, as, as you were saying, you know, like, like you run out of money or you, you know, you run out of time. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, I feel that the, all those pressures actually, you know, worked for the film now that I look at it now. Mm. I, 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 in the same way as you're talking about the anime, uh, I, I, I feel as I watched the film, I, I remember these pressures, but I also remember that there was something that gave it a, a particular energy. There's something chaotic, right. there's something unresolved, but that also expresses the feelings of that I, I had towards much of this material. You know, the other scene that I, I look at it, I go, it, it, it's, it, it's it, like the scene where the burning of the brides, you know, there's, there's a scene where, where Rafi is, is, is reading from the script to the customs officer. Now that scene of the burning of the brides is based on a very famous uh, poem by um, uh, Yarjanyan. Uh, he's called Siamanto, I guess, in, in, uh, you know, but uh, Adam uh, Yarjanyan wrote this and uh, it's called the dance, the poem, but in the original poem, he talks about it from the point of view of a German woman who uh, had seen this happen and is recalling it to him. So it, it, there was a witness, an eyewitness, this German missionary who tells the story to the poet who then writes it down. And then in my film, the screenwriter um, of the film takes this poem and then uh, you know, puts it into his screenplay which then leads to the filming of this scene by the Soroyan character. So there's another level of interpretation. And then that scene is being observed by Rafi, who's watching the filming of that scene on a set. And then he is now relating that back to a customs officer. So look at the, the, the layers of interpretation from this from this, from this uh, moment of like absolute horror, like this, this, this nightmare scene, um, and whether or not those layers amplify the horror, or diminish it, or degrade or obfuscate it, those are all considerations. Right. And but I think in that one scene, you get a, a, an idea of the complexity of the project. Absolutely. And I mean, as you were saying, I think the, the complexity, I mean, the fact that, that, that it, had to, it, it had to stay somewhat unresolved because of the pressures on it. And uh, it, that does actually, I, I couldn't agree more with you that it reflects uh, the, 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 the lack of resolution and the absolute complexity of the subject matter. Um, staying on the topic of complexity, uh, 
one thing that I wanted to mention or, or bring up with you was this, well, uh, we have Rafi, and not only Rafi, we have a, a host of characters in this film who are sort of concerned with the issue, with the very central issue of uh, their identities, of creating or rediscovering or somehow fixing or stabilizing their identities. But complicating this matter is that the film also doesn't completely shy away from the issue of hybridity. Uh, I mean, at points, hybridity, uh, I can think of a, a couple of scenes where hybridity seems more like an annoyance to the characters, like an obstacle that they need to overcome in their quest to fix their identities. But at other points in the film, and I'm thinking, for example, of the opening scenes in, uh, in Ani's home uh, 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 with a large gathering, hybridity uh, appears like an organic and cherished part of characters' everyday lives. So how... Uh, what is what was the thinking of about hybridity on your part that went into the making of Ararat, and and how do you feel about the way that hybridity comes across in the film today? Oh, a, a great question. Um, well, um, hybridity perhaps suggests this idea of uh, joining forces that aren't inherently uh, intended to be together, but then the raises the question of intention and who is defining that intention. There's an agenda. So hybridity actually is a question of perspective. And it's a, it's a question that comes with a, a presumptions and uh, certainly agendas. So what is hybrid from one point of view is integrated in, in another. And, and without, we can talk about this forever because it's something that actually ripples through a lot of my work. Uh, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of many other issues, but uh, you know that things can be reformatted and understood and given a space, you know, uh, uh, I guess you could say it's uh, almost, um, what would be the term? I mean, it's uh, like Foucault had a term for this, right? Where there's a space where things are negotiated in a way that doesn't exist outside Heterotopia. Yeah. So this is this was uh, I think uh, this was the term. Yes. So so it, it's a heterotopia. Good. <laughs> it came, I knew I knew if I looked it up uh, in the right way. And, and it was Foucault, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 No, it, yeah. no, it is. It's a, heterotopia is a concept elaborated by philosopher uh, Foucault. Uh, Yes, anyway, I won't, I won't give you a lecture about that. <laughs> no That's problem, not, not at all. But, but, but when you're talking about, you know, a hybrid space uh, or a space where a hybridity is, is, is allowed to function, I think that, that folds quite quite elegantly into that term. Right. So, so do you think, do you feel that, uh, I mean, in the, in the end, um, how is it that, uh, how, how, how do you think the film squares the circle of characters that are on the one hand sort of trying to fix determined and singular identities, but on the other hand are contending with this, uh, with these sort of uh, hybrid or, as you were saying, sort of interlaced, uh, we can put it in a different way, identities that, that complicate this, 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 uh, this, uh, this singular identity. For example, the sort of the, the Franco-Anglo-Canadian-Armenian uh, okay. community. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 honestly, that's where I think maybe the film becomes unwieldy. You know, I mean, because I mean, there it's trying to deal with a lot of different uh, uh, political issues. So to bring in uh, uh, Celia and to bring in this notion of her as a Quebecois character and uh, having her history and then actually being silenced by Ani, who actually uses the French language in a, an incredibly I would say uh, almost assaultive way, you know, it, you know, like uh, when she actually tells Celia, you know, uh, like that she doesn't need to remember that history. But the, the 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 construction of what she's saying in French is so elaborate that actually Celia is actually silenced, right? By you know, by someone who's speaking her language, but in in, in a way that's actually colonizing her experience in a right. way and, and 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 asserting that and and it's not even as though Annie is is French you know like that that's what's like perverse about it she's using it uh, a language which is not her maternal tongue obviously she's Armenian but using it in, in in this way that actually leads to 
Celia's act of violence against the painting. Right. I mean, the, 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 what I mean, you, you brought up the scene that that, uh, that is sort of one of the most powerful scenes of the film for me, because if I had to actually pick a favorite character from the very densely populated world of Ararat, it would be Celia, oh, who, I mean, desperately trying to give meaning to her father's yeah. death. As you as you just pointed out, she is denied this meaning by Ani, who did witness the death, but tells Celia, and I'm going to quote in the English subtitle translation version, I can't remember it the way you want me to, and even if I could remember what you want me to remember, I won't. I don't need to. So, right. That's right. the moment in French that I was talking right. about. Right. And so... Yeah, yeah. So this scene, this scene came up actually in a, in a recent Paris Institute course uh, devoted to the concept of forgiveness, where we were studying the work of Vladimir Jankalevich with our instructor Viktoras Bahmetyevas. And now forgiveness may be a means of attaining closure and moving on from an offense that one has suffered uh, on the individual level, by the way, which I hold above uh, the national or political level. But forgiveness, and in fact, any kind of closure becomes very, very difficult in the face of denial, as uh, Celia is uh, uh, experiencing at the hands of Annie. Uh, so denial effectively sets a trap in which the offended party gets stuck and somehow remains at the mercy of the offender, awaiting a validation that never comes. So what do you think about this dilemma that is caused by, de uh, by denial in the offended party? And how do you think Ararat sort of deals with that issue? Whoa. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I think that's exactly what I, I, I hope to explore. I, I'm, I'm very flattered that, that you think the film touches on that because I, I, it, it's... <sighs> It's a very complex scene. You can make a film just about that, maybe, and 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 that's where I feel. Um, uh, what I, I I felt when I when I uh, met this actress Marie Jose Croze that that you know because I was so impressed with her that I I kind of re conceived of this character and 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 inserted and and developed it, but I I it's. When you're at the mercy of someone else's, uh, you know, understanding of an event being aligned with your um, feeling of what that event was, but that feeling is tempered by, by denial, you're not actually reacting to the, the the initial transgression. You're actually, you're you're you're, you're you've taken it already into another zone, and and the 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 the, the party who's created the offense only understands perhaps the implications of the action but not the inheritance of what the full range of that denial has meant there's no way that that can actually be uh, understood i don't think and that's where it becomes so uh impossible to have this type of reconciliation unless you can reformat the entire experience And as as time has actually given me given me some perspective on the film, I understand that's that's what I was trying to do was find a way of retelling this so that the entire uh, history of the experience was laid bare and given an opportunity to be rebuilt differently, which is what happens between David and the customs officer, right. I think. Right. I mean, it's not just what happens actually between David and the customs officer. It is what happens, uh, as I was saying at the outset, whenever I sort of show this film and invite students or participants to discuss it, um, these various parts of the film they are brought together by students in, the, in these ever-changing kaleidoscopic reconfigurations of the entire breadth of the event, which I think is what makes the film so powerful. Um, but throughout our interview, throughout our time together, you have been sort of alluding to a certain scene and I've been holding back on drawing you out on it because I have prepared a question about it and I wanted to save it for last because I, uh, I think it's a very, very interesting topic. It's about the scene 
uh, where we fade to the to black and uh, and uh, uh, the, the 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 moment uh, where we never find out about what's in the cans and, and uh, about that sort of final sort of moment of truth between Rafi and uh, and uh, and David because it sort of has a lot of sort of cinematic cinematic history connotations for me that scene because when I when I when I see sort of Rafi's and David's uh, sort of whole interrogation interaction the first thing that I'm reminded of is uh, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner in which we are introduced to this void kampf test which is a complex and long interrogation procedure involving much psychological subtlety that serves to determine whether someone is a replicant or a human now two years after blade runner when james cameron had to answer the same question in terminator he used in true cameronian fashion a much more simple and efficient system dogs now <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that might get a laugh out of you. So in Ararat, David has a dog uh, that could tell him right away whether Rafi is lying or not. The question being, of course, whether the cans, as we said, that Rafi has brought with him from Turkey to Canada have film or drugs in them. But David is obviously no Cameroonian because he chooses not to consult the dog and coaxes, as you were saying, coaxes Rafi to tell him his truth instead. So my question for you, uh, my final question for you, is what is it about truth that a dog can't tell us? Well, uh, well, first of all, a dog has certain uh, senses or has certain, uh, like can smell things and hear things that we are incapable of, of actually uh, uh, apprehending. So from a, a Kantian perspective, <laughs> the dog uh, is, is understanding a reality which is outside of our realm of perception. Oh, by the way, since you brought up Kant, I'm not going to be able to resist interjecting something here because Victorus, okay. uh, Victorus, <laughs> the, the, the instructor of our for forgiveness course, is a, is a Levinasian scholar. And uh, and and Victorus actually, we were walking around. Actually, we in the in the neighborhood where Livnas used to live in, in Paris. And Victorus told us this wonderful story about this text that Livnas had written about his experience as a prisoner of war, Jewish prisoner of war under the Germans, under the Nazis. And there was this dog uh, that showed up in their prisoner of war camp at some point. And uh, until that point, of course, like everybody was treating Levinas and the other Jews in that camp as subhuman completely you know uh, something where even their language didn't sort of it wasn't a valid kind of language and this dog treated them like everybody else and hung around, and they gave him the name dog uh, bobby and they started feeding this dog etc cetera, etc cetera. and two weeks or so later bobby disappeared again and went away again and when Livinas describes bobby at the end of uh, this description he says bobby was the last real kantian in germany <laughs> Actually, I, I sort of feel like we should kind of just end the conversation on that. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I can't, I, I just love uh, seeing Christopher Plummer bark like a dog when, 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 he, when, he, when he does it, when he makes the, the, so maybe I could say that uh, Christopher Plummer becomes Bobby in the film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Christopher Plummer becomes the, becomes the ultimate Kantian in the film. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we can leave it at that. No, I think, I think but, you're uh, right. But, but thank you. Thank you. I mean, this has been, uh, again, it, it, it's so, uh, it's, we you know the, the beauty of, uh, of, of this, of this form uh, making films are, you know, because I also work in theater and I work in opera and, and in a way these are ephemeral, like, you know, the, you have the event and, and yet it disappears because it's, you know, but, but film, you know, is able to persist and, and, and we're able, you know, to show it to people as though it's fresh and, and, and have these conversations, which seem, um, and, and speak of, as I say, you know, uh, you know, it, it is a different time we're living in 20 years after and, and, uh, uh, and I'm very uh, flattered and, and thankful for this conversation. Adam, thank you as well. And uh, with that, we've reached uh, the end of this episode of The Last Ottoman, a podcast series in which we discuss the Ottoman Empire and its legacy today. We are at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. My name is David Silm Sayers. And today I had the distinct pleasure of being joined by filmmaker Adam Egoyan on the 20th anniversary of his timeless film, Ararat. I want to thank, of course, you, Adam, and I would also also like to take this opportunity to thank our audiovisual engineer Bo Davis who uh, significantly helped me sort of through my panic of setting up this interview so thank you again thank you. Adam thank you thank you
So if you, our listeners, would like to support The Last Ottoman or the rest of our nonprofit volunteer work at the Paris Institute, I invite you to become a member of our community. Membership starts from three euros a month and enables free public lectures, open access online journals and podcasts, fair compensation for our course instructors, and everything else we do at the Paris Institute to create a public space for critical and creative thinking. Membership is easy. Uh, just visit our website at parisinstitute.org. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next episode.